Well, welcome. Merry Christmas. We're, we kicked off Christmas here last week uh, with Steve Edwards and uh, just a great, great holiday weekend. If uh, we missed you, it's online, so you can check that out. And uh, today's a standalone because next week we'll have our um, Christmas kind of offering service. We normally every year do a birthday gift for Jesus offering. Next year or next week it's going to be uh, for kids in Zambia. And so really excited about that next week for you to get to go to Zambia in a 3D experience. And so I think that's going to be really awesome. And so today uh, I'm not actually preaching any kind of Christmas message. Uh, I'll do that in two weeks when we have our big Adobe Christmas Sunday. And so I thought I'd dress extra festive for today um, just to be in the holiday spirit. And so, um, so you ready for the morning? Good. Uh, today, the message has no title, but I'm going to talk about serving, and I'm going to talk about membership, and then, um, and then we'll end with a little bit different way today. So, hey, back in the olden days, uh, in the 1980s, <laughs> sorry, sorry for some of you, you're welcome for others, uh, that's 1980s BG before Google, um, Back when I was founded, the common way to research and acquire knowledge was a fantastic monstrosity called the Encyclopedia Britannica. Does anyone here have encyclopedias in their house? Yep. Uh, kids are like, what's that? The encyclopedias were a series of like 28 books, uh, because some letters needed two books, um, and, and you got information from these things. And they used professional writers. They produced a new set annually because, you know, the, the definition of what a kangaroo might be changes from 1986 to 1988. And it was a very expensive investment to buy these. I went online this week, and they are still very expensive to purchase today. And then in 1993, Microsoft released Encarta. Did anyone use Encarta? Uh, I personally hate Microsoft products, but um, an entire encyclopedia on CD-ROM. What's a CD-ROM, some of you may ask? It's a mini Frisbee that went into your computer. Amanda asked Lydia, uh, our eight-year-old, yesterday, she said, Lydia, what's a CD-ROM? And she's like, ah. So um, it made me feel old, if you felt old from that 1980s comment. Uh, and Carta hired professors, experts, and editors to create the world's most accurate database of information up to that time, and it was very expensive to create. It required all these different professionals and constant updating by a team of professionals until it died in 2009. Now, in the early 2000s, another encyclopedia came onto the scene. It required no professional writers, uh, no subject matter experts, Anyone can contribute. In fact, I got into a heated Wikipedia update change with someone on a certain page that is irrelevant to you, but I would add something to it that I knew in my heart to be true, and it would keep getting removed and updated and on and on and on. And Wikipedia, you don't have to be an expert. You can think you know something for a fact, and you can put it on there. And then the world will kind of suss it out and decide if it's true or not. And it's now one of the most popular websites in the world, Wikipedia. It's where, in fact, I got my information about Encarta, uh, was from <laughs> Wikipedia. Wikipedia took content creation for knowledge about things out of the hands of the experts and put it into the hands of the crowd. It's constantly being updated, corrected, added to, and, and as anyone can get involved in filling out one of the world's largest information centers. And, and so collectively, I want you to understand about these things, that the group can do far more than any individual. Previously, information was curated by experts, and we've moved into a world now where everyone can participate, and everyone can accomplish more than a somebody. I want you to, to really let that sink in. It doesn't require a professional, an expert. It, it, it's about the collective. And, and so the church, Adobe specifically, but, but the church, all churches, is a volunteer organization. 
It's the power of everyone working together. The, the only somebody who we worry about, despite me wearing a shirt with my face all over it, the only somebody we worry about is Jesus. The only one person that is elevated above all the rest is Jesus. And, and so we're not built around somebody's. We run on everybody's. Adobe volunteers aren't a bunch of lonely, bored people with nothing to do. Uh, if you serve, you're like, thank you, I, I know that. Uh, but right, sometimes you might think like, well, I show up and everything gets done all the time and how wonderful that other people aren't as busy as me. No, nope, that's just not how it works. It's people just as busy as you who've chosen to make the sacrifice of their time and their efforts. And, and so Adobe volunteers, these are people that believe in the mission of Adobe, to see lives transformed by the power of Jesus. That's our mission here at, at Adobe. This is why we exist. We, we want to see lives transformed. And, and so people who serve, they say, I want to see lives transformed. I want to be part of that. And, and so they get involved in the mission, and they know that they were created to join God in his mission. This isn't, well, the church does that, or some people do that. We do that. Our volunteers serve because there's a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment and, and participating with God in, in what we do. And it's the most fulfilling thing I think we can do is to serve God in his kingdom and at our church. And so my mission today is this. I'm going to try to convince you to get off the sidelines if you're not serving and to get into the game, to begin serving somewhere soon. And if you're already serving, thank you. You're, you're awesome. I appreciate you. And we wouldn't exist without your help. And, and so if you're not serving today, I want to encourage you to, to get off the bench, to step onto the playing field, to maybe leverage some of your time and your ability to make a difference in the kingdom right here at your home church. So if you have a Bible, Acts chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. Uh, here's what it says starting at verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The church exists now. In Acts chapter 6, like the church exists. Jesus has risen from the grave. He's ascended into heaven. The church has gathered. They've been filled with the spirit and, and it's starting to grow. This is like the very beginning of of the church and the apostles are, are teaching and thousands and thousands of people are becoming Christ followers. It's like the greatest time in my mind in, in history and, and it's the birth of this movement that we're still a part of thousands of years later called the church and it's growing. Church growth comes with problems. We sometimes think like, oh, we just want to see people get saved. We do want to see people get saved. But as the church grows, problems come with it. And some of the Greeks now at this stage in church history are complaining that their widows are being overlooked because the Hebrew widows are, are taking preference in the daily food distribution. And, and so the Hellenists, they spoke Greek. The Jews spoke Aramaic and were educated in Hebrew. And, and so I want you to understand, just like back then, just like today, growing church churches have problems. They have different problems. They might even have more problems, good problems, but still problems. How many of you know uh, we'd rather have church growth problems because people are coming and finding Jesus than stagnant church problems or church decline problems? And here's the thing about church growth. Church growth costs money. That's a problem. It costs money to, to do things. It costs money to pay staff, to do ministry programs, to keep the lights on in here. More ministry, as it grows, it takes more money. And sometimes we're crippled by fear, right? And, and the economy might be stressful. Maybe the job market isn't strong. Others uh, of you, we've, we've turned money into an idol, whatever that looks like. We sometimes withhold from the Lord uh, our money. And as the church grows, we sometimes think also, oh, there's so many people. What I give isn't significant. 
church growth costs money. That's a problem that growing churches face. Another church problem growing churches face is growth upsets some people. Does anyone here have their own seat in this church? No, good, don't raise your hand. You, if you get there first, it can be your seat every week. But, but right, what happens when you come to church on a Sunday and in a growing church, someone new, they don't know what your assigned seat is because we don't have assigned seats. And, and maybe they're sitting in your seat. And I think I've shared this story before. Amanda and I interviewed at a church when we were youth pastors in Sacramento. And the very first day we went to secret shoppers and we sat up in like the third row and some lady came up, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're in my seat. We were considering like, do we want to take a job at this church? And, and this lady was me and like get out of my chair we still took the job um end of end of the story you don't need to hear (laughs) but church growth can can upset some people we can't please everybody and there's more critics and the things we do to continue growing can make some people upset and can i tell you i still sometimes very infrequently but sometimes i still get angry notes now and then because our priorities as a church are not necessarily your priorities or they're not necessarily the priorities that we had in the past and can i tell you we're not a perfect church but we are growing and we're reaching people and when that happens sometimes church growth can make us upset because our preferences are being infringed upon Back to the Bible, Acts chapter 6, the apostles, they find themselves in the food service business, and apparently they're not very good at it. They call a meeting, they share their plan for how they're going to deal with this problem, and they select seven people to take care of the food distribution business, and they realize if if we, if the 12 of us, who they were kind of somebody's at that time, they say if we start serving the widow's meals, then the areas of our strength are going to suffer. We are called to, to preach the word. We're called to spread the gospel. We're called to plant churches and, and to lead the church. And, and so if we get bogged down in this one specific thing, the, the church at large will suffer. And, and so the church isn't the 12 somebodies, right? And so they didn't say, well, we got to choose one of the 12 of us to run this thing because we're the 12 somebodies. But instead, they gather everybody. And from everybody, they say, hey, let's find seven who can take over this thing. And they decided to let the leaders lead. They decided you let the teachers teach. You let the cooks cook. You let those who can organize food distribution, organize food distribution, and everybody has a part in the mission, and there's no unimportant task. The body of Christ is made up of many parts, and all of them help the other parts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. He, he put us all into certain places, and there's pastor, there, there might be worship leader that you see every week. We have kids leader, but we also have kids work. We have greeters. We have people in the sound booth. We have people who greet. Like, th- there's no role in the church that is better than any other. All are needed for a healthy body. There, there's not, this group is elevated above anybody else. And so I want you to think about this question. Where does God want you? Where's your place in this church? If this is your home church, God has planted you here, where does God want you to serve in this church? These guys weren't just feeding people. They didn't say, well, the the 12 somebodies are too spiritual to handle distributing food. The the people distributing food were doing a spiritual task. Acts chapter 6, verse 6 says, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on on them. They were commissioned in ministry and, and distributing food was a spiritual transaction that took place. And so I want you to understand when we say we want everyone to serve in this church, it's not to fill a role. It's because we want you engaged in the spiritual business of what God's doing here. Everybody at Adobe needs everybody else involved and engaged serving in their role so that our body is complete and healthy. And I, excuse me, I'm choking on my spit. 
Serving is for everybody. It's not for the elite few. It's not based on most organizational numbers for 20% uh, while 80% show up and, and consume. Can I tell you, anyone can serve in this church. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a super Christian. I want to challenge you and encourage you in this. Serve somewhere. I'm talking to you. Yeah, you who are thinking, well, not me, because I don't want to get involved. He's talking to the person next to me, or he's talking to the people in the front row. No, front rows are emptier today. Good job. They're already serving. (laughs) The easiest thing when you hear someone say, serve somewhere, is you think, yeah, the, the church should do that. No, you. You should serve somewhere. This is my personal ministry philosophy that no one has proven to be uh, wrong to me yet. And here's what it says. It says, every person in every church has a place to serve. That's just what I believe. That this, there, I don't have a scripture verse to back it up other than, um, you know, the whole Bible supports this idea that if, if you're here, God put you here for a reason. And if you're here, you're part of the body. And then that means you're an important part of the body and you should be involved in some way. Adobe's your church. There's a place for you to serve here, and we need you to serve here. While people can learn through good preaching, obviously, uh, personal Bible study, small groups, most people don't grow past a certain point if you're not involved in serving others. There's some kind of lid that, that comes on our spiritual growth when all we do is take in, take in, take in, and we never give back in any way. And I've seen it over and over again in about 20 years of working in local churches. The more you put into your church, the more you get out of it. Now, I'll I'll let you know, my job is to stop you from burning yourself out. I I know you maybe have had experience in churches where you got overworked or you were like the hot shot volunteer because no one else would serve and you just were over serving and, and you got burned out. I'll do my very best to make sure that doesn't happen to you. I don't want you serving in seven ministries every Every day of the week until you don't like Jesus anymore. That's, that's not what church ministry is about. And so I don't want that for you. And, and so I want you to think, where are you serving? Are you serving? And if you're not, where can you serve? In one spot. There's a place for everybody. What are you putting in to your church? So the apostles figure out this widow food service issue. Acts chapter 6, verse 7 says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a larger number of priests became obedient to the faith. It's interesting that the result of the, uh, the disciples figuring out this food service program isn't that the widows became happy with the ministry that they created. That's not what it says. It says... A large number of priests became obedient, and a large number of disciples increased rapidly. It says the word of God spread. That's what serving does. It's not about doing a thing. It's about building God's kingdom. We don't fill volunteer slots. We don't babysit kids in kids' ministry. We don't pass out handouts to invite people door to door. Every act builds God's kingdom. That's what you're doing when you serve. Everybody that serves in some capacity is spreading the gospel and building God's kingdom. When, when someone in a church service gives their life to Jesus and, and you were greeting out a door or you were in the parking lot or you cleaned up some trash around the property or you helped with kids three weeks before that, you're part of that person giving their life to Jesus. You've been created and gifted to serve. You use your passions and gifts throughout the week, in your home, in your job. Why not leverage those things for your church? So serve somewhere. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's no uh, easy segue. That was part one, serve at your church. Part two, I want to talk to you about membership. Um, And so, so here's the thing. Membership, church membership, Adobe Christian Church specifically membership. What's the difference between coming to church and becoming a church member? What's the difference between like, well, I just want to be part of it versus I am part of it? The main difference between church membership is buy-in and commitment. Let me start off by saying this. Anyone, repeat that back to me, anyone, anyone can attend Adobe. 
and be part of this church. Anyone can come and, and be here on a Sunday, and you don't even have to serve, despite what I just told you. Like, we're not going to kick you out if you don't in three weeks, right? You're up. Oh, you're not serving. We, we preached a message on it, and so now you got to follow. No, anyone can come here on a Sunday at any time. You are welcome at this church. But like any organization that you might be a part of, membership usually comes with a set of requirements or responsibilities or expectations of the members. Uh, I went golfing one time at a private country club golf course in Elk Grove, Elk Grove Country Club. And um, <clears throat> I'd never been at this country club and a friend got us in and I was with a group of pastors. And fortunately for me, I was dressed appropriately. Now, my worship pastor friend who was with us was wearing cargo shorts with pockets sewn on the outside. And from the clubhouse, uh, out comes a membership person and said, you can't be here with those shorts on. He didn't fit in to the membership requirements that, that were required of that course. They made him go into the clubhouse, buy a set of shorts before they would let him out onto the course. Now, to this day, I still laugh hysterically at him because uh, had that been me, I would have been mortified. I would have left. I don't like situations like that, um, but it wasn't me, and so I can still laugh about it today. But every organization that you're part of, they have membership requirements and expectations. And so I want to share with you today the four pillars of, of membership here at Adobe. Uh, they're these, they're unity, responsibility, testimony, and ministry. And so I'm just going to go through these four with you this morning because I also want you to, to get involved serving. That doesn't require membership, but I want you to consider becoming a member of this church at Adobe. So pillar number one is unity. Romans 14 verse 19 says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Members agree to protect the unity of the church. We're not a cult where you can't question things, again, despite the shirt. Um, but, when, but when we do it, we don't do it in a way that hurts God's kingdom, where it hurts other believers. We, we do it in unity with our church and with the people in our church. And God's heart is community, community. It's, it's us together. It's our church working together towards the same mission. We're here and we're all on the same team. And I told you our mission earlier, I want to repeat it again. This is our team motto. It's to see lives transformed by the power of Jesus. That means the lost are transformed to being saved. That means the saved are being transformed into disciple makers. That means the spiritually immature are transformed to maturity. It means you being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And so members, they carry the Adobe mission everywhere they go, and we walk in unity with God and with each other. We commit to love other members, even the ones that you don't like. We love everybody. And so maybe we don't get along with everybody. Maybe not everyone's our best friend, but we love everyone. We're committed to say, listen, anyone who becomes part of this church, I'm going to love them no matter what because I want to remain in unity with God and with my church family. We commit to refuse to participate in gossip and slander. Now, I don't know if we live that one out all the time because gossip feels good. It's fun to share information that we shouldn't. And when someone wrongs us, we want to talk bad about them. But we make this commitment to say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to talk about people this way. We commit to following and supporting the leadership God puts in place in this church in unity. So that's pillar one, unity. Pillar number two, responsibility. Luke 14, 23 says, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. The second pillar ties into what we were talking about at the first half of this message when it comes to serving. Members share the responsibility of the church. In fact, the Bible says that my job isn't to do the things that make the church run. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. It's to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. It's what the disciples did. They said, well, we need some people to run the widow ministry. We, we need to raise up some people to distribute few, food. And, and so they did that. And, and that's what my job is in this church, is to equip you to do the work 
of the ministry so that people and the kingdom will be built up. The pastor's job is to equip the people. Members of the church accept that responsibility and they say, yeah, I, I want to carry that responsibility. I want to be engaged. I want to be involved. Members carry responsibility in a couple ways. They carry responsibility by praying for our church, its leadership, its people, and its growth. Do you pray for our church to grow? More people means they might sit in your seat, they might park in your space, might stand in front of you with big hair during worship, or they might be really tall in the middle and it blocks the video. Who knows? But everyone's welcome. Do you pray for the church to grow, even if it bothers your convenience? Do you pray for me? Do you pray for the staff? Do you pray for the board? Do you pray for your church? Members carry responsibility in prayer, but they also carry it in inviting the unchurched, the dechurched, the lost to come to church. When was the last time you invited someone to come to church? Better yet, my preference is that you lead someone to Jesus outside the church, and then you bring them. They say, what's next? Well, come to church with me. We'll figure it out. When was the last time that happened? Members are responsible for that. Members carry responsibility by warmly welcoming anyone and everyone who comes to Adobe on a Sunday. We put greeters at doors. We need more if you're friendly and you want to serve. Uh, but also, the way churches retain growth is by having members who are greeters. What does that mean? It's, it's members who don't seek out the same four and no more. Well, this is my little clique at church, and I only want to talk to these people every Sunday, and I don't want to branch out. I don't feel comfortable. Members don't do that. Members come on Sunday, and they bear the responsibility of seeing someone new or seeing someone they don't know and, and introducing themselves. We take that responsibility, the weight. You say, you know what? I'm going to initiate growth in this relationship with this person I don't know. Members take the responsibility of inviting a stranger who might be sitting alone and say, hey, why don't you come sit with us? Members take the responsibility of giving the aisle seat to someone who's new. And you might say, well, I came early so I could get that aisle seat. <laughs> That's what I said when I would go to church. Like, I didn't get here 30 minutes early so I could be squished into the middle and lose my buffer seat between the person next to me. But members say, you know what? I can tolerate sitting by someone for an hour. And in fact, maybe I'll make a new friend. And in fact, their radar is up to try and make new friends of everyone who come into the church who look like they might be new. Pillar number three is your testimony. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Rebecca, if you want to come up, you are your testimony. Your testimony is the story of God at work in your life. And so it's the gifting he's given you that, that you use to make this church better. It's your talent and ability and time that God has given you that makes this church better. It's your Christ-like heart and attitude that makes this church better. Did you catch all of that? It's you who makes this church better. It's your presence. It's your involvement. It's your in great engagement. And, and it's great for you. You get when you serve and get involved and, and commit to a church. But it also makes our church better. Our church is better with you. Did you ever think about that? That if you're not serving, you might be robbing someone else in this church of some incredible things that God's done in your life. We need the story of God at work in your life because someone who's here right now or someone who will be here in the future is gonna go through something that God has brought you through. And that person is gonna need to connect with you so that you can say, hey, don't give up. I, I was right where you're at. God brought me through. They need someone who can cheer them on, who can pray alongside them because when they want to quit, you say, hey, I, I didn't give up on God and he saw me through and you don't need to quit either. We live in a selfish, self-centered society. This worked out to be a really good sermon prop. Totally intentional. 
such a self-centered society. We complain about everything. Your use to customer service support available 24-7, around the clock, for everything that you ever could want to complain on. My Amazon account has been flagged, and when I complain to customer service now, they just don't help me. <laughs> they said, you've received too many benefits from our benevolence, and you get no more help anymore. And you know, they don't appreciate you telling them, if you didn't screw up all the time, I wouldn't have to complain to you. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that attitude resonates with you sometimes. I think it's been worse the last couple of years. People are just kind of more critical and we're at a heightened level of stress and, and anxiety. And, and so we're, we're selfish, we're self-centered, we, we complain. And can I, I, I tell you, I know you're busy. I know that sometimes on a Sunday you want to break. I know that if you get involved with the church, you might have to work with people. You'd love it if the church was just for dogs or cats. If I was like, hey, who wants to serve in the cat ministry, I would have no shortage of volunteers. But I, I get it. Working with people, they might let you down. They might do something that hurts you, disappoints you. Maybe you'll even grow close to them and then they'll leave and ab abandon you. Can I tell you, it's worth it? Even if pain does come from it, like Jesus built these close friendships with 12 people and one of them he knew in advance was gonna betray him. One of the closest ones he knew was gonna deny him and he still said, I'm gonna be with people I'm going to get hurt, and when that happens, I'm going to manage it in a healthy way. I'm not going to continue to let people hurt me in that way, but, but right, there's healthy ways to process these things, and, and the church needs you to work with people. God's kingdom right here in this region of the world gets built by you. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. That means even if they're going to hurt you, it's still worth it. And most likely, that's not going to happen. Pillar four, ministry. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Members support the ministry here by these four things. Attend church services and other church activities. If you're a member, be involved at the things we do. Number two is live a godly life when you're not here. Uh, you got to be a Christian to be a member. And Christian means not just on Sunday for an hour and 15 minutes when you're here, but also the rest of the week when you're out there. Members support the ministry by giving regularly your tithe and your offering. Members support the ministry here by serving a ministry of the church. Membership requirements at Adobe are super simple. Uh, Philippians 1.27 it says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Be a Christian. Come to church. Tithe and be generous. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, on the first day of every week, one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Uh, it's part of our faithfulness when we say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to commit this part of my finances to you. And that's a requirement for being part of the church because if you're not invested financially, you're, you're not able to make the decisions that are required to, to be made by some members because members get to choose board members. They, they get to choose the leadership of the church. They're eligible to become the leadership of the church. And finally, we just want you to serve somewhere. We talked about that. Matthew 28, 19 says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You probably aren't going to go to all the nations, but your responsibility is to the area of the nations that you live in. And I can tell you this, I've talked to more and more pastors in, in this county since I've been here. This is a mission field. You don't have to go anywhere else. There's plenty of people to be one into the kingdom right here. And so it's real simple, this membership piece. It's unity, responsibility, testimony, 
in ministry. My hope is that if you consider Adobe your home, that you'll consider becoming a member, that you'll, you'll say, I want to be part of the team officially. Members also carry the responsibility. They elect a pastor when there's a vacancy. They nominate and vote for people on our board. We're actually going to do that uh, this month. Nominations will be open at the end of this service. I'll give you instruction on that. And members will get to nominate uh, some future openings for next year at our business meeting. One of the greatest potential responsibilities of being a member is the opportunity to serve on the church board, to be in leadership at a church. And so I want to end today a little bit different than what we normally do. And and we're going to pray for our current board. Um, Let me tell you before I invite them up, The board doesn't carry the complaints of the people to the pastor. You might not have known that. Maybe in some churches you've been at before, well, the pastor's not listening to me. Let me complain to the board members. Uh, We already covered. We don't complain. Um, That's not their role. Their role is to carry the mission of the church to the people. We're all mission-focused here. Anyone to be in leadership of this church has to understand we're here to see lives transformed by the power of Jesus. That's the number one requirement to be in leadership of this church. Are you passionate about transformed lives? So I want to encourage you, when you find a board member, when you see them today and you recognize them, it's not, hey, let me tell you uh, what I'd like for you to do. It's, hey, thanks so much for serving. It's, I want to be praying for you. Thanks for carrying the weight of spiritual leadership. Any member is eligible to serve on the board. The responsibility of the board is to oversee the the finances and the facility here at Adobe. And board members are extra invested spiritually in prayer and time serving to Adobe. It comes with extra responsibility, but also requires more spiritual maturity and And so you might be thinking like, I wonder if I could do that. If someone nominates you, maybe you could do that. And and the Lord raises leadership up. And and so it's just an exciting thing that I I want for you potentially one day. You might even see over the next month, uh, these letters are going to be out and around the campus. Uh, There's a letter with instructions. There's a nominating ballot and then a membership list on the back. And so if you're not a member, uh, come chat with me, send me an email. Let's talk about membership. Uh, you won't be able to nominate this month, uh, but, but every year this comes around. And, and so uh, we're currently receiving open nominations for board elections next year. I'll tell you about that in a few minutes, but that's all I have for you this morning. I want you to remember, serve somewhere, become a member. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for your church, for for this group of people who call Adobe home, Lord. I I pray that today you challenge them to consider their place at this church, to get involved, to serve in a ministry, Lord, and to potentially commit to joining the team, to get the Adobe jersey, to say, this is my home, and I want to commit to being part of it. I want to be responsible for what goes on here. Lord, it's your leading. It's your speaking. Nothing is done out of guilt, Lord. We're not trying to persuade anyone, God. We're just presenting what the Bible says and and the blessing that comes with being committed and engaging in the church. And so, Lord, I pray today that you'd bless each and every single person and that you'd speak to them in Jesus' name. 